think most people think of plants as static things. Plants don't have brains, right? But behavior is just a response to a certain stimuli, and plants have that. There are all these complex things that are actually going on behind the scenes that plants are doing, sensing and responding to their environments on time scales that aren't necessarily the time scales that humans are usually attuned to. Our work focuses primarily on interactions between plants and other organisms, uh, including insect herbivores that want to uh, consume the plant, uh, pathogens, uh, insect pollinators. You have all this invisible language that you really have to figure out what it is. Not just what they're saying, but who is perceiving. We want to understand the ways that organisms, particularly plants, um, sense their environments and construct information about their environments. In these very sophisticated ways that they have to signal, to communicate, to interact with each other, and to defend themselves. There is this plant, Cascuta, also known as daughter. This plant is a parasite, so it only can survive if attached to a host. So they have a very short time to find the host, and nobody knew how they did that. If you look at the footage of the daughter, they're doing the searching, and then they grow towards the host plant. So we thought maybe they smell the other plants, and then we found that they did. When we first talked about this, a lot of people said, well, plants don't move, they don't move fast enough, that really can't happen. And that's where the time lapse came about. If you do the experiment without the time lapse, you don't see all this beautiful dance that they're doing, this searching. That was the first time we really showed that in an ecological relevant system, you have a plant that can find another plant based on the smell. The purple devil is a solanaceous plant. It's a wild plant in the tomato family. When you look at this plant, you notice right away that it's specialized for defense. It's a very aggressive looking plant. One of my area of focus in research is to understand how these pines affect caterpillars, the herbivores which feed on these plants. One of the main caterpillars is called tobacco hornworm caterpillar. One of the things that always fascinates me is how do they respond to the defenses that the plants mount upon feeding. When you are a bigger caterpillar, you have to feed on different leaves, you have to move around the plant. In many cases, the spines will actually poke through their body and then the caterpillar is immobile and then they, it will die there. For small caterpillars, the spines doesn't matter to them because they can actually maneuver around the spines. However, Purple Devil has another set of defenses that effectively uh, kill these caterpillars. So what it does is, uh, and this is very cool, so when the baby caterpillars feed on a leaf, the plant will produce a sticky substance at the site of its feeding and it basically glues their mouth parts and their limbs. So it affects the mobility of the caterpillars, but not with spines, but with this sticky sugary substance. And after 48 to 72 hours, the caterpillars tend to die. So what we see in this plant is that the small caterpillars induce the production of the sugar balls, but the, the, the larger caterpillars uh, this, this doesn't happen. So obviously the question there is why? Well, if you look from plant's perspective, it's really hard to produce this much sugar consistently and it won't make much sense because it cannot keep up with producing the sugar for big caterpillars. That brings us back to the question, how does the plant know? How does the plant understand and regulate the production of sap 
based on the type of caterpillar or the age of caterpillar. What we think is happening is that the spit of the younger caterpillars is different than the older caterpillars. And what happens there is one induces this sugar balls and the other one doesn't. And I think this is quite interesting in this idea of, you know, this arms race between the plants and the herbivores. A lot of our recent work is focused on understanding how plants are actually able to prime their defenses in response to cues that indicate that there may be uh, impending attack. From my perspective, the most interesting thing is to th sort of think about the information that's shaping the behavior of the organism, that's shaping the traits of the organism. Ecology traditionally has talked a lot about the flow of energy through ecosystems. We haven't talked so much about the flow of information through ecosystems. That's somewhat of a new topic, and it's an important topic, because one thing that's happening with climate change and environmental change is we're fragmenting habitats and we're changing the landscape where animals live, but we're also in many cases disrupting the flow of information and disrupting the signals that are carrying information between species and so forth, and that can be equally problematic from the point of view of preserving these systems. Every time we look at something, we discover another layer. These plants that we think are this immobile organism have very complex ways to interact with the other organisms in the environment. It's wonderful. I really don't think we'll ever run out of questions. <laughs>